Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching The Salty Sea, and today I am going to go through Iron Jaws as fast as I can because the spirit of the wah is upon us and we have no time to waste. Iron Jaws are sweet. Um, they are one of my go-tos anytime I want to have a good time playing Warcry and still manage to uh, do something effective on the field, Iron Jaws is usually what I go for. I've been painting them in this color scheme for ages, and I've even got you know more on the way. Uh, every once in a while, I get to drop everything else and just paint Iron Jaws. So I love this faction. Recently took them into a 15-game narrative league, which was a ton of fun. Uh, I took second with The Legend of the Crump Pharmas. Um, Iron Jaws are amazing because they just love playing a really fighty, smashy game. But unlike some of the other factions that like to play that way, like actually a lot of Stormcast like to play a really smashy game, but Stormcast often don't have the tools to force the opponent to smash with them. And Iron Jaws really do have those tools. They can sort of bring the smash, bring the fight to the opponent, force the opponent to actually have to try to fight them back, um, which is really awesome. And it creates for really compelling war cry and it's also just really amazing how they just play exactly how you think they should play they're a ton of fun in both narrative and competitive which is uh, not something that every faction can say i had a ton of fun finding cool narrative stuff for them but uh, this is going to be kind of more <laughs> more for both than just narrative but who who cares i'm going to put up my story here you're done reading it by now i'm sure you're uh, very fast readers Here's the skinny on the heroes. We're going to go through this quickly. You can ignore the brute boss with the claw. You can ignore the wizard. You can ignore the piggy boss with the hacker. Now, the piggy boss with the spear is actually pretty solid. Um, it will, especially in narrative where you can put some pretty busted items on it, and then the 8-inch move plus 2-inch reach is amazing. Um, but it will get across the field really quickly. It has an attack profile where it's got six strength, which is awesome, but only two, four damage. But what you can do is you can charge it into combat and just get a huge bubble of the field because the base is quite large and you can just put a lot of attacks onto little chaff monsters. It's just a very, um, you know, it's a very consistent piece that will, you know, be fast for treasure missions. It will sort of, nothing can hide from it. It's it's just a very nice utility piece in general. The mega boss up next for me, actually that's a brute boss there, but whatever. Uh, the mega boss is just an incredible smash piece. Um, he takes the plus one attack blessing incredibly well in terms of how much damage he does. Now, this is another one where the base is huge, but not in the way that's really good like how the piggy boss base is huge because the piggy boss as you can see here maybe you can't see but the piggy boss base uh isn't as wide so you can get it through terrain but then the length of it is incredibly wide so you can sort of use it you can flip it sideways to uh hold off a really wide area the mega boss base is a little bit tougher to use. Uh, you will occasionally have a tough time with terrain, but it is incredibly survivable at 35 wounds, 5 toughness. It does an incredible amount of damage, especially when you bless it. And all of that is just an, a very strong package. The War Channer is sweet. Uh, he has a really nice ability where he can give a plus one attack aura, and he only has to spend a double to do it every other version of that ability in the game is on a triple, which makes the War Channer very reasonable. He's also just got Toughness 5, 32 wounds. Very, very survivable. The Brute Boss is really strong, but more as a utility piece. Uh, it's got Umesson, which is an incredibly important ability and is the thing that makes Iron Jaws good in competitive play. Uh, it's also got Duff Up the Big Thing, which just gives it plus one strength, which can allow it to hit on threes, even against toughness six stuff, which is nice to have, especially in a Vexmore meta. It will not necessarily smash as hard as the Mega Boss will generally. I mean, it has to be using Duff to really get that extra damage in. If it's not using dice on the attacks, something like that, uh, it won't impress the way the Mega Boss does. But it is, you should essentially think of your Brute Boss as a wizard because it will be using your dice every single turn, both either to do damage 
or to secure an objective. Uh, it can't do both, but that's fine. Uh, then finally, you've got the Ardboy boss, which is just a really solid, efficient piece that is also pretty cheap. The attack profile is very, very nice in terms of you know what you get for a 140 point fighter. It also, as you'll see at the end of this video, having it as your leader allows you to fit things in an Iron Jaws Warband that you just wouldn't be able to fit otherwise, which uh, gives you some really nice options there. So all five of those heroes are amazing and absolutely playable, uh, which puts Iron Jaws in kind of a unique position, which I really love that uh, you can just you can make so many different things work with it, as long as you know what the strengths and weaknesses of what you've selected are. In terms of the troops, you want to focus as much as you can on Ard Boys or specifically the Brute with the Gore Chopper. Uh, the Gore Chopper Brute is insane. He does, uh, as long as you're willing to, you know, spend dice on him, give him onslaught, stuff like that. Uh, he's insane. He has you mess in. He can duff up big things. He can charge, um, he's got two inch reach, he's got it all, he's amazing. Um, he's a great deal for the points, so are the Ard Boys, both the one with the shield and the one with the big choppa. The one with two choppas costs five more points for some reason, it is unplayable, don't use it. The other fighters in Iron Jaws are interesting. Uh, the Brutes, so the Gorehaka, the Spear Brute, and the Choppa's Brute are okay. They're reasonable, they are very durable for their points, but other than that, uh, both of them have some damage issues. The Gorehaka has even worse damage issues. 3524 uh, is not what you want for 150 points. 4424 um, is not awful for 140 points, but it's still not necessarily blowing you away. The thing that they are for is putting you messin' onto things when you can't afford a gore choppa and that's just a perfectly reasonable place to be right not every list that you build with iron jaws is going to have either a brute boss or a gore choppa brute those are the brutes you really want to be running but if you've got something else exciting in your list that means you don't have space for those running one of these 150 or 140 point brutes is perfectly acceptable uh, i feel that way also about the gore grunta with the Jagged Gore Hacka, that's the non-leader version of the Spear Piggy. It's nice because it just gives you a lot of utility in terms of uh, an incredible amount of reach on the battlefield, the ability to you know charge and get a really long way, hit something really far away, 10 inches away, and sometimes hit it twice with eight dice. It's fairly consistent in terms of its ability to do that in terms of getting to any part of the board so if you want speed in iron jaws that's where you want to go 35 wounds is also just a nice place to be uh, a lot of the other fast things in destruction are much more killable than the uh, jagged gore haka so that's just a good spot to be he's a great treasure carrier you know only going down to six move six still when he's carrying a treasure is a great place to be and then 35 points is awesome so um you can also do cheeky things like use charge to get towards the treasure not take it you know within an inch and then um, be able to double move and just be like completely out of there where, where they'll never kill him so stuff like that can be good the gore grunta with pig iron choppa the 250 point pig i'm less enthused by the only reason I don't have it completely in the ignore column is if you are really excited to be able to pick out and kill three toughness chaff, this guy's incredible at it. And just re-recording here to just note that with the Gore Grunta, with the Pig Iron Choppa, it's, there is a lot of T3 in the game, but your Ard Boys naturally counter that stuff. And so there's just a lot of times when it's going to feel very redundant because the only time you're going to be really happy that you brought the uh, ch regular Choppa Gore Grunta is when you're up against someone where their entire warband is T3, right? Because then you've got your Ard Boys and this guy that are both really countering that. Um, that's just not going to happen that often. And so a lot of the time, I think you're going to regret this piece, even though it does have applications, uh, which is why it's not entirely in the ignore column. So I blitzed through the unit overviews quickly because I wanted to get to some of the fun things to think about with playing Iron Jaws. And the first one is what flavor of Ardboy to play. Uh, 
I think they they did a really cool internal balance job here with the Ard Boys, where the two weapons that matter are really evenly matched. Those two are the shields and the big chopper. As you can see here, I get very excited about both because I think they are very, very strong and uh, some of the better fighters in the game in their weight class. So head to head, they each average out dealing three damage to the other. So, you know, you can't really think about it in those terms. If you brought a whole bunch of choppas with, uh, or big choppas and your opponent brought a whole bunch of shields, don't sweat, you know, that's not going to be what decided the game. But in most games, it's going to matter what your play style is, how you decide to play your warband, and what your warband is trying to accomplish. So let me kind of <laughs> explain that a little bit. It matters who is fighting who on the board, and how you plan out your game is going to determine whether shields or big choppas would be better for you. So you have a lot of fighters in Iron Jaws who are big, scary leaders like your Mega Boss and your Brute Boss who are really good at fighting other big fighters. Um, the Mega Boss excels at taking out the biggest thing near it and then eventually fighting one chaff model later in the game and clearing it out. Um, and it doesn't really excel at clearing out a bunch of chaff fighters because it's kind of easy to run away from. All you have to do is get farther than four inches from the mega boss and it can't sort of charge and double attack. Um, it can't, there's a lot that it can't do, right? And so it's generally not going to clear chaff faster than your opponents sort of chaff hunting specialists can. And so that puts it in kind of an odd spot where it's actually much happier just fighting your opponent's biggest, scariest thing. The Brute Boss is in a similar situation. Um, the Brute Boss really wants to either stand on an objective and just win it with you messing, or it wants to be kind of hunting down an opposing leader, um, especially like anything in that 160 to like 220 point range. Uh, the Brute Boss just like can't wait to go fight those kinds of fighters. So um, when you're doing that, when you are having your biggest, scariest fighters fight their biggest, scariest fighters um, just for like big kaiju battles, you are just naturally going to have your chaff fighting their chaff. And in those situations, you really want big choppas because big choppas will actually clear the oppo opponent's chaff in a way that the shields just won't. And in Iron Jaws, you're rarely going to be ahead on bodies. Um, you will sometimes, and I've written a couple lists that will occasionally uh, have the numbers advantage, but a lot of the time you won't be ahead on bodies, and so you'll need to kind of clear them out. You can't just protect a lead with your shields, and so that's where you're going to want those big choppas. They absolutely shred the strength three, toughness three chaff that you'll see on a lot of, you know, objective mission heavy packs, the kinds of fighters that people will bring to those packs. Big choppers absolutely destroy them. And they even are pretty nice looking against toughness four chaff as well, uh, because they have that strength four, they deal that two damage. So when you're hitting on fours, every four and five is worth two damage. It's very strong. Um, so you're just dealing a lot more damage with your big choppers than you would with your shields. And so you're clearing off your opponent's chaff. And so you have a real chance if you have big choppers and you have something like a mega boss or a brute boss, you have a real chance of just winning every fight, which sounds crazy, but it is true of Iron Jaws is that you can just win every fight on the board if you put your heavies into their heavies and your chaff into their chaff uh, in a way that won't happen if you bring shields. However, a lot of the time you can get into a chaff clearing race and you do have fighters like, say, uh, the pig that really want to be kind of running around the board, scoring points. Um, you have fighters like your um, war channer who, you know, is more of a tech piece, not really trying to fight the opposing biggest fighter. And so in those situations, a lot of the time you're going to want shields. You also might think like if you have a brute boss, um, you might be much more interested based on the pack that you're going to see. You might be much more interested in having your brute boss not hunting specific fighters, but hunting specific parts of the battlefield. A brute boss is actually pretty good at scoring points in a lot of situations. 
in missions. And so if that's the case, you might want shields with your brute boss, depending on how you plan to play that brute boss. Um, you might want shields because shields protect a lead. They will be very hard for your opposing you know, your opposing fighters to clear them off. And so if your opponent is trying to score points by picking you off the field, you want shields. And then you can kind of sort of race on points there. Um, it's two very different philosophies for how to play, but both are absolutely effective. And Iron Jaws are completely capable of sort of executing on either plan very effectively. Um, but just make sure that you know which plan you want to do before you commit. You can even do, and I've um, enjoyed this very much a few times actually, you can even do a split based on deployment groups and sort of change your art boys based on that. So for example, I've had a deployment group that was a mega boss and one art boy, and I put a big chopper with it because I knew if the opponent had anything big and scary near the mega boss i was immediately going to go after it with the mega boss so it wasn't going to come over and attack the art boy which meant that i didn't need a shield next to my mega boss because i wasn't worried about that art boy getting attacked by something big and scary which meant i wanted the extra damage because i wanted to be able to clear off little chaff fighters i wanted to be able to avoid the mega boss getting bogged down one thing that you know Opponents can use little guys like Blood Reavers as nets on your mega boss um, and sort of prevent him from getting where he needs to go by just sort of being in combat with him and sacrificing a few points to deal with it. And an Ard Boy with Big Choppa can actually do a really good job just clearing it out so that now your mega boss can go do more important things. But then in my other deployments where I was much more worried about just like needing to keep things alive, knowing I didn't have as much hitting power, I put shields in those deployments and it worked out nicely because now there weren't just like soft targets to pick out. The opponent wasn't able to just like kill things quickly. And so that gives more time for my mega boss to come over from another deployment to come join the fight, right? So in those situations, it's actually really nice to mix shields with big choppas. Um, and I think that's just another thing where if you just try to think about how you're going to try to play out your games on the tabletop, uh, you can kind of figure out which art boys to use in which situations because they're both very strong. And when you have two strong fighters, it's uh, it's it's cool because you can't go completely wrong. Um, but it's also just like finding that last 10% of effectiveness is a uh, really tough puzzle to figure out and something that really draws me to Iron Jaws. I love this stuff. So now I've talked a little bit about playing Iron Jaws in terms of the uh, the context of what Ard Boy is best, but I want to just give more tips on them because I see a lot of Iron Jaws lists that I think look really strong and then they don't always do that well in a tournament. And I think it's because Iron Jaws weirdly are... Um, kind of tough to play. Uh, the biggest one is because they're slow, other than the pigs, you really cannot waste a single move action because you're probably only going to have like one fast fighter in your list. When I play a lot of other factions, I like to have three fast fighters and then mostly slow people um, so that I can put at least one fast guy in every deployment. Iron Jaws can't do that, which means you really want to actually plan out where your moves are going to go uh, before the game, if possible. So, for example, if you're taking Iron Jaws to a tournament, you'd want to study the deployment map um, before the tournament and figure out how you want to deploy and even just, like, you know, bust out your trigonometry and measure out how far you're going to be from your various goals with Iron Jaws so that you can go sort of in a straight line. Iron Jaws always want to be taking the most direct path to every single uh, goal that they can achieve because otherwise you just don't have enough movement to do it. Now, you do have dice to get to where you're going. Iron Jaws always can get to where they're going with either wah or charge, but because your movement is tied to dice, your movement is very sort of constrained by the choices you make, which is why Again, you can't waste anything. As you sort of do those initiatives, um, you really want to spam doubles as much as you can unless you specifically need wah movement. Um, 
you know, while we'll get a crowd of iron jaws to a spot, you know, turning them all into move five, sometimes even move six. But anytime you're not wogging, uh, you're going to be either wanting to be charging or onslaughting. Uh, they have a lot of fighters that are really good with onslaught. For example, your mega boss, your um, brute boss, that are just amazing. So if you hold damage or if you hold dice as doubles, thinking you're going to be charging all the time, and you end up in combat without charging, that's perfectly fine because you want to be onslaughting so much. But charge is really, really valuable. Um, the reason I kind of <laughs> said. You know, Onslaught is a nice uh, consolation prize, but what you want to be doing is charging is because the amount of damage you get out of charge is kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. If you think about um, any time charging gets you into combat and allows you to double attack, you're essentially just getting all of the damage from your attack action on just a double. And when your attack actions are, say, a blessed brute boss or a blessed iron or mega boss and you're getting like 15 damage from the attack that's pretty absurd and if charge sort of allows you to get all of that then it's an incredible ability um i've at, at times claimed that charge was the best ability in the game uh along with its sort of brother abilities like uh, slaves to impulse or um gorger maw pack has a version of it I no longer think they're the best ability in the game, but they're definitely close. They're up there. They're some of the best doubles in the game. And uh, the fact that Iron Jaws has it everywhere is really good and something you want to focus on. On any non-objective mission, you just want to be doing as many doubles as you can. Um, even something like Rampage, which is two additional uh, moves. You know, usually when you're rampaging, it's because you roll the three, but it's not necessarily more value sometimes than just having a whole bunch of doubles right i mean it's still pretty amazing a high rampage obviously on a mega boss or a brute boss is going to be absurd but any kind of charging around that you can do is going to feel like little miniature rampages all the time which is amazing the only time you really change how you play with iron jaws is against ogres stormcast and skaven so i just wanted to shout out those three matchups i've played you know Iron Jaws like dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, and the yeah, the one matchup where you have to really change what you do, you're not always just charging into combat. You're not always just trying to onslaught your opponent. Um, you're not always sort of picking out objectives to do you messing on is these three matchups. And the reason that they are scary is because Stormcast, depending on the Stormcast faction, not all of them, like Quester Soulsworn can't do this, but some of these Stormcast factions, like Thunderstrike, Warrior Chamber, and Black Talons, can actually play the Iron Jaws game better than Iron Jaws can play it. Now, Iron Jaws, I think, is better than Stormcast as a faction. They're more powerful than Stormcast, but the reason they're powerful is they can force opponents to play their game. They can charge to make sure they get into combat and get as much combat as they can. They can you mess in which means numbers count for nothing, and now you have to kill the brute boss, which means you have to come into combat with the brute boss, right? Um, they can sort of make big clouds of plus attack bubbles with their war chanter. They can force the opponent to kind of play a certain style with them, which is really wonderful, and Stormcast can't do that. But when Iron Jaws say, come at me, bro, and force the game to be about fighting, Stormcast doesn't mind. Stormcast is actually better at playing that game than Iron Jaws are. Um, and so that puts you in a really tough spot against Stormcast. And then also, you know, if you're using fancy abilities like you mess in, Stormcast are immune to that, right? And so they can kind of play your game better than you, which means that you need to really finesse against them. You want to be avoiding combat. Um, you want to be hopefully like scoring a lot of points by outnumbering them with hard boys, things like that. Um, Skaven and Ogres are even tougher to beat in this way because Storm Fiends specifically kind of have a field day with a lot of what Iron Jaws brings to the table. A Storm Fiend can kill a brute just like so fast. Um, specifically the Grinder Fist Storm Fiend that even though your Iron Jaws all have T5, that grindy boy Storm Fiend just hitting on fours, four eights it just it counts to 25 disturbingly fast and speaking of counting to 25 disturbingly fast 
gut lords out of ogres are a real problem. So you kind of have to flip roles in these situations and play finesse. Um, a Bogolai ally can be very helpful, um, especially with the sort of nerf to Brugitz, where before you could sometimes brute force your way through these matchups by having a Brugit, um, hopefully having more numbers, and then just like waiting and then getting a big Brugitted up attack to kind of upset the apple cart, even though even though your opponent's fighters are better in combat, all of a sudden you get this one explosion and that can kind of change things. Um, that's harder to do now, now that Brugitz cost 20 more points. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually does change how many fighters you can get into a list. I'll show you soon. Um, and so having the Bogolai there at 70 points with just a net uh, can be a nice little backup plan against Ogres and Skaven. Those are still bad matchups, but a Bogolai does significantly help there. So when we're actually building our Iron Jaws lists, the first thing that I think about is, do I want a fast thing? I think in general, in Warcry, speed is a bit of a crutch. Uh, it's sort of playing with training wheels. Uh, generally, I think you want to be as slow as you can possibly be while still getting to every spot on the board you need to get to. Um, you know, every every movement that you every inch of movement that you don't use is like wasted points. Essentially, is how I see it. But that said, you do have this fast utility piece, and I've played my pig boss a ton and the reason sometimes you need that crutch is some missions and some sort of deployments you just simply don't have the movement to get there without spending a ton of dice and that can put you really initiative role dependent um, anytime you really need a high wog to get to where you're going that's going to be a rough spot so spot the deployments on any tournament you go to to figure out if you need a pig or not. Um, but just know that you, if you want, if you can, you want to try to avoid avoid pigs as much as you can. One pig can be good, especially the leader pig, but two pigs I think is generally gonna be a mistake when you're playing Iron Jaws. One thing also is to think about you messing and how much of it you need or want. Um, a lot of folks are kind of moving towards missions that are like objective missions in terms of needing lots of bodies, but don't say the word objective on them. Uh, things like at Adepticon, they ran a mission called Bloodshed. Um, there's also more quadrant missions that we see nowadays where just having the most fighters in a quadrant gives you points. And that's another one where you mess and doesn't do anything. Um, so. If your event has a lot of those, you probably want to avoid having a bunch of brutes in your list. But if your event that you're looking at has two objective missions, um, you're going to need brutes, maybe even two. Like, look at what the deployments are on the objective missions and try to have a brute on the field in round one um, pretty early on. So, or like in both of the missions. So, maybe you'll need one brute, maybe you'll need two. Um, the reason I think that's important, even though you won't be using Umesson in round one, you often won't be able to get your brute boss from a round two corner deployment or side deployment. You won't be able to get your brute onto an objective because you'll need to use dice just to get there. And then you won't be able to use Umesson once you get there. And you could lose the game just because you lose an objective on round two that you really needed to win. Um, so you'll want to have your Brute Boss already on the field round one, um, or your Gore Hack of Brute already on the field round one, so that it can then use its ability round two, which is usually the most the most important time to take an objective, because that can then, you know, then you're fighting over it, It'll, you'll often have ties in rounds three and four, and so getting the objective and winning it outright in round two is an incredibly important thing for just breaking those ties. So that's why you're going to want your brute boss, your gore hack of brute, on the field in rounds, uh, in rounds one for all the objective missions. So if you're taking Iron Jaws to a tournament, you're going to just want to make sure you have the fewest number of brutes possible while having a round one brute on the field on every objective mission. Is kind of the the rubric there. Um, when you're building and thinking about allies, uh, this is another place where you can think about speed. If you don't have a mega boss, you should really consider bringing an ogre 
to your list because mega bosses kind of do what ogres do. They <laughs> they just win fights against like everything, right? Um, and uh, so you don't necessarily need an ogre if you have one, but otherwise you really want to have one, especially um, because you know a lot of missions are won by who has the biggest thing on the field, and Iron Jaws are really fighty, but they won't necessarily have the biggest thing on the field very often, and that's where an ogre ally can really help. Uh, Clawback can kind of count as an ogre ally, especially if you have another really scary fighter like a brute boss or a mega boss in your list, because a clawback gives you speed without being sort of completely dedicated to speed. So a clawback will move five and it has charge, so you can, you know, reach things that are 11 inches away and still get an attack step with a clawback, which is a really wonderful place to be. Um, but it, you know, isn't like super, super fast. So it's still a very good combat piece, which can, which can be really nice. Um, if you are spamming Ard Boys, you don't necessarily need a fast ally or anything like that or any kind of combat ally because you're swarming now. Um, but Gloom Spike Gits can be okay there because Gloom Spike Gits leaders have a, um, a plus one attack bubble buff that isn't as good as the War Channers because it costs a triple instead of a double, but it can just be a nice little backup there. So something like a Bounder Boss from Gloom Spike Gits can be a reasonable fast ally to include um, if you're, say, like spamming Ard Boy Big Choppas, something like that. So let's dump a few lists on you. One of the cool things about Iron Jaws is now that Divine Blessings exist, I don't think you're really locked into any one build, um, especially now that the Brute Boss is gone, or sorry, not the Brute, the uh, Brugit is gone, um, or just 20 points more expensive, it gets really hard to fit into lists, so there's not you're not necessarily locked into that philosophy anymore. So I've put four lists that I think are all pretty reasonable here. One, I wanted to include a pure list no matter what. So a Ferocious Mega Boss, a Gorgrunta with the Polearm, a Brute with Gorchapa, and then four Ard Boys is just a very smash and grab type of list. Um, I'd probably want to have like three of these Ard Boys with big Choppas and probably only one shield. Um, because, you know, only seven models, you're trying to fight a lot, but you do have a little bit of speed with that Gore Grunta there so that you can kind of uh, get to objectives around the board or get to treasures around the board, things like that. Hunt down, you know, the last fighter you need to kill, stuff like that. Um, and then this Mega Boss is just going to be an absolute unit in terms of the gravity that he uh, asserts around the board in just one quarter of the battlefield, which is a great place to be. Um if you want to have an even bigger, more gravity boy, though, uh, having an Ard Boy boss can allow you to fit a Ferocious Gut Lord into your list. I think the Ferocious Gut Lord, which is a plus one attack blessed Gut Lord, is probably the biggest threat in Warcry at the moment um, in terms of like what is the scariest thing you can bring to the battlefield. It's a plus one attack Gut Lord. And so... Normally that would be really hard to fit into Iron Jaws because we're very tight for points in this faction, but an Ard Boy boss is what unlocks that type of stuff. Um, getting an Ard Boy boss gives you just a little bit of a combat fighter that can hold down certain fights um, while the Gut Lord dominates the field. And then you can have a brute, a regular brute to do that as well and also be able to put you Messin onto objectives. And then five Ard Boys here just to kind of give you the activations you need to sort of wait things out with the gut lord to make sure that it's getting the highest um you know the, the most effective uh attacks that it can the most effective kind of target priority that it can and then just wanting numbers because your your hitting power is going to be all focused on that gut lord right and so this way you'll be able to kind of run around the field and, and sort of cap objectives hold treasures with your art boys while that gut lord just does work um I think the Ard Boy boss is really cool for being able to be in these types of lists, and it's just a good place to be in general. Uh, if you want to score a bunch of points in missions, um, this is a very kind of cynical list, this scoring points list, in terms of it's not necessarily about doing any one really cool thing or sort of any kind of uh, 
philosophy of how it wants to play the game. It's just focused purely on uh, trying to complete mission objectives. So you're going to have a ferocious brute boss here um, and a clawback and a bogolai and four ard boys and one regular brute. So you're going to have multiple, or two sources of you messing. Um, you're going to have the clawback with its ability to kind of bounding leaps and get really far around the board while still, you know, having a decent combat profile for a good price. Um, it's not the most points efficient sort of overall in my eyes because it's a very killable piece. Um, but the cool thing about the clawback is uh, it's very killable to your opponent, but it's also very good at escaping. You know, like the clawback can really run away if if your opponent like needs to kill it, they can often be in kind of a tough spot. But uh, when you commit your clawback, yes, it will die. But ideally, you're committing it in a place where you will get your money's worth and then you'll be bogged down and killed. And that's totally OK, because, you know, that's making sure your clawback is hunting down and killing, say, in a kill mission, like the target you need to take down, um, the support wizard that needs to die. Right. Uh, the clawback is really great at taking those fighters out of the game before it also dies. And it's a piece that. It's like you trade it usually for fighters that are actually worth less than it in points, but worth more in um, like scoring mission points, etc. You know, etc. Um, the brute boss is there to actually trade up and to fight fighters who are sort of worth more than it is. Um, your brute boss, when it's using duff up the big thing, can put on real damage onto fighters that are actually you know, 250 points, 260 points. And so something like a FOMO Crusher might actually tread carefully um, in when it's in range of a Brew Boss and, and try to stay away from the Brew Boss, which is an amazing thing to have for just a 230-point fighter. Then, of course, your Bogolai is there to hopefully slow down things like uh, Gut Lords and Ogres and Knave Black Talons, who you are sort of concerned that you won't be able to fight on even terms, or you are concerned that are just going to kind of rip through your fighters, um, rip through your Ard Boys, anything that you're scared of there, that's the Bogolai's job is to cover for it. And then, of course, for Ard Boys, just a lot of efficiency here. Um, which flavor you choose is going to be entirely based on the metagame you expect to see and the the uh, the objective control versus kill missions. You know what what types of missions you expect to see. Um, but either flavor of good art boy is going to be really solid there. And then just the one brute to just have you messing and again just score points. So this is a very cynical list that I think would be. If you set your deployments correctly for a given tournament, I think you would have a really good chance to win any tournament with, with this list. Last, I have a really fun list uh, around the War Chanter Aura buff. I think the War Chanter is just so freaking cool. Um, and you can pair it with two Brutes with Gore Choppas. Again, just an incredible piece in terms of the amount of damage it does for the price and how hard it is to kill for the price, and then it even has a good ability. Um, then you, of course, have the one Bogolai. The Bogolai here is actually less for, like, uh, you know, intellectual reasons and more just to make the points work because the real star here is five Ard Boys with Big Choppa getting the War Channer plus one attack buff. Um, if you get lots and lots of Basically, the War Chanter plus one attack buff is not as good as Onslaught on a similarly costed, more combat-oriented hero if you're only getting one use out of it. But if you have multiple Ard Boys or a Brute with Gore Choppa, I mean, the Gore Choppa Brute is incredible with the War Chanter buff. Um, so if you have like a Brute and an Ard Boy in range of the buff and they get attacks in all of a sudden for just a double, you're getting something that's way better than just an Onslaught. Uh, from your War Channer, and it's, I find it really enjoyable to try to sort of beautiful mind setups where you can actually make that happen. It's very difficult, but I find Aura Cry to be like some of the most fun you can have in the game. And uh, the War Channer is also just such a charismatic piece. I love my War Channer. So like anytime you get to put him on the table and have him be good, it's really sweet. And these War Channer, uh, these War Channer like flavored lists are actually legitimately pretty good. Um, I used to play a War Channer list that was War Channer, Pig Boss, and then just like 
a million art boys and it was pretty solid i actually was very impressed with how it ran so um you can do a lot with orchaner uh the last powerful leader that i didn't talk about is the pig boss i didn't make a list for that but it is solid you just want to um make sure that you pair it with a lot of sort of combat output um you know whether that's just efficiency with lots of big choppa art boys or whether that's just having multiple gore choppa brutes in there because um it will not be your output engine it will be your utility piece that gets everywhere on the board so you just want to build with that in mind and have like a really scary output fighter um even something like a ogre crusher something like that in your list um to just pair with your pig boss so that's all the lists um for for iron jaws i'm going to show today so i figured i would just do closing thoughts with uh some of my art boys and <laughs> brutes and piggy boss that uh that i like to play with um this is my iron jaws warband missing a few of my fighters like i don't have my uh mega boss in there um but i really love this faction i hope you love it too i think this is a faction that i've wanted to do a guide on for quite a while because it is very powerful. You can absolutely win tournaments with Iron Jaws. I've seen it happen sometimes. But you really need to make the most out of positioning with this faction. You need your charges to all hit and to all be impactful. You cannot waste a single um, movement it with Iron Jaws. And so this is a faction that really rewards kind of planning your game out before you play it, planning your tournament out before you actually start things up. It rewards uh, getting your deployments right and having the right fighter. At the right so it's actually a very, very tricksy faction, despite the fact that it's just a whole bunch of giant orcs rumbling across the field. Um, and I really love when combat, because it is, they're pure combat. They want to be fighting all the time but they're a very complicated combat faction. And so I really like that sort of construction here. Um, I've heard a few rants about how, you know, in AOS, they used to just be pure smash and now they're more thinky smash and people are upset about that. Um, I think in, in kind of always been thinky smash. And I just think that's a fun play style. Um, if you do want pure smash, you can get it. You can just, like run multiple mega bosses, something like that, and you won't necessarily win all the time, but you um, you'll still have a great time. Uh, if you do want like pure smash, no thinking, uh, I think ogres are probably better for that than iron jaws are. Um, not to say that ogres don't require thinking. I think winning tournaments with ogres requires a lot of thinking, but in terms of just like points efficiency, combat, that's. Iron Jaws is really when you want to be kind of using your ability soup to its maximum while positioning perfectly and getting pretty punished if you don't, but getting maximum rewarded if you do. So I hope you have fun with Iron Jaws. I certainly do. And uh, when you play them, may all your rolls be crits.